Is, uh, <coughs> is the sound, it sounds okay? okay? Good. Okay, so thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today in this, uh, this meeting, which has been worryingly good so far. So <laughs> the bar seats have been raised quite high at this point. Um, and uh, it's nicely varied as well. So this, I, I think, is, is, is going to pick up on some previous things, but be different in, in character. Uh, so what I want to do is to pick up on, uh, describe some recent uh, work on mixing time of Markov chains. So, so we've certainly seen Markov chains so far in the meeting. And um, there are many, uh, well, the thing you want to know is, um, <coughs> How quickly does the Markov chain reach its uh, stationary distribution or get close to its stationary distribution? And uh, we've seen some good examples of that happening or that not happening earlier on. And um, so this goes back decades, this, this study. Um, so computer science really had a great uh, impact on the mathematical study of stochastic processes, in particular Markov chains. Uh, because uh, really until the computer scientists came along, uh, the, stu the study was sort of asymptotic. So you, know, you have a Markov chain, and then it converges asym you know, uh, exponentially to its stationary distribution. Um, but what computer science, what the theoretical computer science perspective does is say there's an N in the background. There's a size of the N. So you're not just interested in whether it's, um, the, the things are converging exponentially fast you need to know what the dependence on the n is. So, um, so, that's, so that's had a big impact. And there's, uh, that, this has been active for many decades. But just as you think that things are settling down and getting a little bit dull, some major advances come along. So, um, so there are two main threads. One, one is uh, where you want part samples uh, from the exact distribution that you're interested in. So that's perfect sampling. And um, more. Uh, and then the other game is approximate uh, sampling, where you want to get a sample which is very close to the in, uh, desired distribution, but not exact. Um, so, so actually, um, a lot of the work I've been doing recently has been in perfect sampling. Um, and I've been, you know, that's, uh, so it's been an unusual audience. So probably I could have got away with talking about perfect sampling, but it's in some in some areas um, for some audiences it's got a bit stale. And and in any case, the recent ma major advances, as I say here, have been based on Markov ch chain simulation. So you've got a you've got a distribution you're interested in. You express it as the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. You simulate the chain, and you're interested to know how the, how long you have to run it until you get to um, a, a sufficiently good approximation to the stationary distribution. So um, I'm not involved directly with all this stuff, and it's highly technical. Um, but maybe because of that, I thought I could perhaps give an impressionistic o overview, so, because I wouldn't get sucked into telling you about detailed stuff. In fact, um, so this is the 45, well, it's the 40-minute version or the 30 five minute version. So actually, uh, the, the full version has some hints about how proofs go. Uh, but what I want, uh, but uh, the objective today will just be to talk about what you can do with this technology. So I want to view it from the point of view of the user. Um, and but of course, you have to put something of your own in. So uh, at the end of the, the day, I'll, I'll like, say how I could use this, uh, these results. Um, on a modest application. And the nice thing is, one, the, the proofs are really hard, but when it comes to applying the stuff, uh, it, uh, the, these mixing time bounds rely just on some very simple um, parameters of the system. So it, it's something you can use even if you don't understand. OK, so uh, it's always good to do it. Uh, uh, when time is short, uh, define things by example. So there'll be a single running example going through this, and then everything will be defined in terms of this. Um. OK, so I'm, I guess everyone knows what an independent set in a graph is. 
because this is a, t this is a computer science audience, so it's just a sub subset of vertices, no two of which are adjacent. So I'm starting out with a finite graph, um, and I, I'm going to set, uh, so somehow the, the, the degree of the graph is going to be important, so I'll set a maximum degree delta. And omega is going to be the set of uh, all independent sets in the graph. And um, I've got this real parameter, lambda. And I'll say that the weight of an independent set is just lambda to the power, uh, lambda to the power of the size of the independent set. So, um, yeah, so, so, so this is, um, okay, let's, let's, let's finish the slide. Okay, so the partition function is just the normalizing factor in the probability distribution. So it's the sum over all configurations of the weight of the configuration. And that means if I divide the weight through by Z, I get the probability of, so the hard core distribution is the one that assigns probability weight divided by the normalizing factor Z to the independent. So in relation to uh, previous talks, um, say uh, for Francis Bach's talk, um, so the, the, the energy is minus the cardinality of the independent set, I guess. Um, uh, so so we're, talking about, we're talking about the same thing here, but, uh, but, but like the stat fizz bit has been diluted a bit. Okay. Now, of course, this, uh, these situation, this situation is a lot easier than stuff we've seen so far, right? Because um, independent sets are very simple objects compared with pandas and uh, cycles and the Eiffel Tower. So they're gonna, it's going to be infinitely easier. It's going to be hard to analyze, but it's a lot easier than those complex situations. So that means uh, on the other side of the scales, we're going to have to do better. We're going to have to get more precise results out to justify our, ourselves. Okay. So what, what is a Markov chain that converges to the right distribution? So that it converges to the hardcore distribution on uh, independent sets. Well, here it is. This is called Clauber dynamics. And all this means is you take random vertices, uh, random single side updates. So you, you have your graph, um, you've got a current independent set which you want to modify, select a vertex uniformly at random, and then you update it. You update it according to the correct rule. Now what is the correct rule? Well you look around your, so the gamma is supposed to be, the gamma is supposed to be the uh, neighbors, the neighborhood of V. So you look around you, and if there's nothing of the independent set in your neighborhood, well, that means that you yourself, V, you are free to be in or out of the independent set. OK, so if there's nothing around you, then you should update. And with appropriate probability, one chosen so that you hit the hardcore distribution exactly, with probability lambda upon one plus lambda, you, you put that vertex in. You ignore whether it was there before or not, right? You forget. Um, with that probability, you put it in, and with the remaining probability, you leave it out. Otherwise, if there is something in your neighborhood, uh, you have to leave it out. Otherwise, you would move to something which is not an independent set. OK, so that is a super simple um, Markov chain that um, converges. I mean, OK, so. The very standard t methods tell you that this converges to the right thing. You, it technically, you, you look for detailed balance, whatever that is, and you show that the hardcore distribution is the, satisfies the detailed balance condition. Do, do ask questions as, if anything gets... Uh... Okay, so what we're interested in is the... Um, Mixing time. As I say, what we what we want to do is to measure this uh, in terms of the size of the system. So this is the this was the new thing back in the nineteen uh, eighties, and various things can happen. Um, I guess until recently, we basically concentrated on whether the convergence was polynomial or exponential. But with the high power tools that now exist, we can start talking about optimal mixing, uh, mixing in time n log n which I call optimal because you, 
because intuitively, by coupon collector, until you've run n log n stop steps, you haven't hit every vertex. And it seems unlikely that until you've hit every vertex that, that you've got some chance to be in equilibrium. Uh, this can, yeah. It can be shown in, in a number of cases that you can't beat n log n, but Showing that as a lower bound is surprisingly tricky. It's, uh, so it's not quite coupon collector. OK, so we want, uh, these are possible behaviors, and we want to see what happens in particular instances. And we'll, and we'll explore this in the context of the hardcore model. Right, so as lambda, lambda remember, um, is a, it controls the weight. The, it's, so it's lambda to the size of the independent set. So as lambda increases, this is, like, this is like temperature decreasing in physics terms, if you think about this in terms of energy. Uh, then the independent sets tend to get bigger. You're, you're weighting things towards large independent sets. And you would kind of expect the mixing time to increase. So, uh, right, because as, as the independent set gets denser, it's, it's kind of starting to freeze up and it's difficult to move around the state space. This is just intuitively. So we, that's something we expect. OK. So let's, uh, let's see what might happen. So here, uh, so I consider the, the graph, which is uh, like two-dimensional lattice, um, partly because it, it um, gets across the point, and partly because it, it sort of draws a connection with physics. Oh, so hard, the hardcore model is supposed to, well, it's, it's, um, it's a model of a gas, and I guess to discrete, dis, you discretize space, and then you only allow the atoms to be on those locations, and, and um, you disallow the, the, the atoms. But another, another thing it can be is a gas. That, that can be a crystal lattice, and you can have a, a gas um, being adsorbed onto the, uh, onto the surface. OK, so, so there are kind of a, a lot of the, OK, it's, it's all theoretical computer science. But at the end of the day, the, the, the problems, a lot of the problems are coming from statistical physics, because they're nice, clean things. They're not, they're not pandas. So, uh, so, this is, uh, so let's see what, uh, what happens as the lambda increases. So uh, you, uh, you can imagine that, uh, so I've, I've colored it as a checkerboard in red and blue. And you can imagine as, as lambda gets very big, uh, the, the, the independent set pretty much has to be maximum. And what are the maximum independent sets? Well, they look like that or, or, it's, or the other one that you can just imagine. And uh, of course, for any finite lambda, it won't be quite that. Uh, it will be a, a perturbation of that. So it will be some of those red vertices. Uh, it will be most, uh, all those red vertices, except that some of them will be absent. And, and a few of the other vertices, which are not red, will be present. Um, but it will be a perturbation of that thing. Uh, or. Uh, it will be a perturbation of the blue thing uh, uh, because, again, that's, uh, that's the other maximum independent. So there are only two maximum independent cardinality ma independent sets in this. Um, and so what we're assuming this informal view is correct, uh, what, we're ha what we see is that typical independent sets, they, they coalesce in, in, into two phases. Uh, which are like uh, small perturbations of these red and blue. And you can imagine if, that, if that's the case, which it is, that you're not going to be able to move um, very easily from the blue configuration to the red. It'll take you exponential time. Just as it took earlier on, it took exponential, well, it took, the exponential time doesn't really mean, it took a long time to get from one Gaussian to the other. Right, because you have to go, you, you go, for, you go through um, configurations of much higher energy. Okay. Uh, somewhere between the red and the blue, you're going to have to go through 
uh, a partially red, partially blue independent set, and that is going to be very suboptimal. Its cardinality will be very small compared with these guys. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if, if the lambda is small enough, we would expect uh, this, this order to, to disappear, right? If, if lambda is like 0.1, we would imagine that actually there's no structure to a typical independent set. And if there's no, there's no obvious structure, there's nothing to stop us moving around the state space. And this is, this is, this is actually true. So, um, so I call this prehistory, uh, which is not technically correct because, because these things are written down uh, way back in uh, the 20th century. Um, and what, what was known back then, it, so remember that uh, G is a graph of maximum degree delta and N is the number of vertices. Um, then if lambda is sufficiently small, then the mixing time of that single site dynamics uh, will be n log n. And uh, you, you can write down what the, what the lambda would need to be. If, if it's delta equals 4, uh, as it is for the lattice, the 2D lattice, then it's enough that lambda is less than 1. Right, so, so a lambda equals 1 is obviously is just uh, an unweighted independent set, so you're just sampling... Uh, an independent set with, with no. Um, and this, uh, uh, well, uh, so I said it was a simple, it's a simple coupling argument, whatever that means. We'll, we'll see an example of coupling a bit later. Um, but of course, it, it's what seems now to be a simple coupling argument. At the time, it, of course, it had to be invented and you have to see that this was a good way of doing things. So. Uh, so that's an uh, important observation. Okay, now, so that is for small lambda. Now, if lambda's big, then the mixing time becomes exponential. Now, the interesting thing is, this is it's not just that sampling the maximum independent set becomes uh, uh, inaccessible to this particular algorithm. It's that the problem is, so it's not the problem of the algorithm. The problem is that uh, sampling independent sets as a problem becomes computationally hard. So if, um, if I take delta equals 25, that's quite, I mean, it's quite a high degree, um, then already at lambda equals 1, the problem of sampling independent sets has become MP, uh, MP hard. Okay. Now, at, at the time, so this is over 20 years ago, I imagined, so there's, a, there's obviously a gap there, right, between delta equals 4 and delta equals 25. And, and clearly, um, neither is actually correct. Uh, oh, that was clear at the time, but I would uh, uh, imagine that there would be never any hope of bringing those two things together. But that's indeed what's happened very recently. So now we can actually, uh, well, some people can uh, have, and I've checked their work. Uh, you can, for any particular delta degree, you can get a critical lambda such that below that, one thing and above that, another thing. But we'll come to that in a bit. Um, okay, so here I reveal what that critical lambda is, and you can even write it down. It's, uh, there it is at the top there. It's, it's uh, some easy function of the, of the delta. And you can actually, you can see for delta equals 4, that's going to be uh, 27 over 16. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a long way from 1. So, yeah. Right, so... Uh, this is Weitz, uh, came up with, actually, a, for the partition function, a deterministic algorithm. So this was quite remarkable. Uh, obviously, for sampling things, you need randomness. But in theory, for computing the partition function, it's just a number. So you could put, perhaps do it with a deterministic algorithm. And he did this. And this worked for any lambda strictly less than this, um, the, than this critical value. Um, on the other hand, 
Um, much later, uh, Galanis, Stefankovich, and Vigoda, um, followed by Sly and Soon. So uh, I, uh, Galanis and et al. did this for uh, may, uh, maybe missed out degrees four and five or something like this. They did it for most degrees. Um, and so if lambda is, is bigger than the critical, um, and, and this is now for any degree, this was Sly and Soon, uh, then the problem itself of sampling independent sets is NP hard. Okay, so with, not, with such a nice uh, expression for the critical lambda, there has to be some explanation for it. And what is it? Well, you could view it um, as a phase transition on a large random regular bipartite graph. So if you, if you stack up, if you have a bipartite graph, so you've got vertices here, vertices here, and then you, you put random edges between, subject to the constraint that all the, vert, all the degrees have to be delta. Let's not say how that has to uh, happen. Then this critical lambda will, be, will mark the, on, the onset of a phase transition. So, uh, so slightly below, you'll see equal, it'll be disordered. Equal numbers, or the independent set will be, it, it, it will exist on the left and on, on the right in about equal numbers. But then when you go over critical, um, the independent set becomes unbalanced, and in order to fit in, no, in order to fit in a big enough independent set, you, you need to put more on one side than the other. And, and so now you now you you're like the checkerboard. You you you've got a right-leaning independent set, a set of those. And then the other phase, you've got a left-leaning set. And you can't move between them. And once you've got that, you can imagine, well, that's like a gadget. It, it's a truth-setting component, as we would, as Gary and Johnson would have called it. And then you have to show that you can construct um, a clause-testing component, but you can. And that's basically, that's basically why that problem becomes NP-hard, at, at the, beyond the critical point. Um, another way of looking at it, this is more stat fears. If you've got an infinite regular tree of that degree, um, in physics terms, it, uh, if you, well, the, you have a, a technical problem that you have to define what it means to have, um, what, what the distribution actually is on an infinite graph, right? So this, but this technology is all well understood. And when you do it, uh, you discover that above this critical lambda, the, the, the infinite tree will have two phases, and it will be the checkerboard thing again. So there will be a phase when um, the, the guy at the root is in, uh, tends to be in, and there's... Anyway, leave that to ima your ima imagination. So, yeah, so it'll, there'll be... The, the one phase will be skewed towards the red, and the other phase will be skewed towards the blue. OK, so I hope everyone's on board so far. Um, Okay, so this Weitz, our, our, I don't know how um, he came up with this idea. It's, it's got a couple of tricks in there, which are amazing. Um, but its downside is, although it's a polynomial in N, the degree is large. And then, actually, as you approach the phase transition, it becomes larger. So it's got very bad, it's got very bad dependence on lambda and on delta. Um, so it would be nice if we could show that Glauber dynamics mixes rapidly, because then we'd have a very fast algorithm, and one that's much simpler to implement, I mean, super simple to implement. So, yeah, so can we achieve the same end um, just, just by simulating the Glauber dynamics? Um, okay. So uh, I can just tell you what, um, what the result, uh, what the uh, sort of flavor of the, these new results and what you would need to do in a particular example to show rapid mixing. And often, um, in the past, that's meant polynomial. But uh, now, uh, this, what I'm going to describe can, can often get you to n log n, which is usually the, 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 the best you can hope for. OK, so you have to compute this uh, inf influence matrix. And so it's an n by n matrix. Um, and 
you, let's, so i and j are vertices. And what you're doing here is you're, first you're fixing uh, vertex i to be in the independent set. So I'm, I'm coding it up as a, a zero one function where one means in and, and zero means out. So that first term says, what's the probability that j is in the independent set conditioned on i being in the independent set? And then the other thing is, what's the probability that j is in conditioned on i being out? So it's just a, co it's a covariance, covariance, except that it's, not, it's slightly different. And, and somehow, it's very delicate, this, when you, do the, when you do the calculations that you have exactly the right object. Anyway, that's it. So this is correlations between i and j. And you would hope that below criticality, those correlations are going to decay rapidly. So hopefully, this is like ones on the diagonal, because perfect correlation. And, and hopefully, away from that, they, 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 they go to zero quite quickly. Now, the catch is, uh, that's not, uh, so we, we, if we could just operate with that matrix, it would be nice and simple, but we, it gets a little bit more complicated because we have to be able to fix uh, the spins, let's call them spins, the in or out of the independent set um, on any subset. So we have to be able to take any subset S of the vertices and we have to be able to say, for every, everything in S, whether it's in or out of the, so we fix the independent set on S, and then we compute the, we compute this matrix again. Of course, the matrix is a bit smaller now because it kind of excludes S, um, but then you have to do the same thing again. So you look at the correlations. And when I first saw this, um, I thought, uh, as many people presumably do, that if you fix, if you fix uh, uh, some subset of vertices, surely the correlations go down because you think, well, I fixed that. The, the information is going to it's going to be harder for information to flow from i to j if there's if you fix some stuff in the middle. But this this turns out to be completely wrong if you start playing around, and this does complicate the whole calculation. That you have to you have to work with the possibility of arbitrary. Uh, sets of vertices being fixed in arbitrary ways. Okay, so spectral independence is, uh, we look at the maximum eigenvalue of this, and uh, if we're super lucky, uh, well, I mean, the extreme would be just one down, down the diagonal, be just the identity. Um, maximum eigenvalue would be one. As, as it is, it'll be bigger. Well, actually, it might, it might be one. Uh, I mean, it can be, because some of the entries can be negative, actually. But anyway, um, naively, uh, we, we're thinking of one plus a bit, and we're hoping the bit is, is not too big. But actually, uh, as long as, as, long as uh, eta is a constant and doesn't rise with n, then, then we're in business with this method. OK, so, and then what the, what's the theorem? So I think, despite the fact that the, uh, like proving this thing here is uh, pretty tricky, I mean, I can... I can read the thing, check every line, but I'm not sure how, how it was ever invented. It's kind of one of those things. But nevertheless, if you just want to apply it, it's, it's quite nice. Um, so we have a graph of maximum degree delta. We've got some distribution on there, which is spectrally independent in the sense we've just looked at. There's a local side condition, but it's super easy to check, and it usually holds. In that case, the, the mixing time of Glauber dynamics is uh, optimal, is n log n. And the constant uh, depends on eta, uh, which is the spectral independence, and, uh, and the delta. Um, but it doesn't, uh, right, but obviously it doesn't depend on n. That's the, that's the thing. This is where the, the wind comes in. The dependence on n is always n log, is all, always optimal. And here, here you can read off, so because I need to get on, you can read off uh, uh, how this developed. I mean, uh, I have, it looks as, yeah, this 20, the, the sequence looks incorrect if you just look at the dates, but I, this Anari et al. paper took ages to get into journal version, but it's out now. It actually predates the, uh, the other stuff. OK, so actually taking the, reusing the technology, some of the technology that came from Draw Weitz's paper, you can show 
eta spectral independence below criticality, and that immediately from this theorem uh, tells you that you, you've got n log n convergence towards the um, stationary. Okay, um, now this is, uh, this is a very small change of viewpoint. So here is a condition which is actually a little bit stronger, but it uh, gives you a different way of thinking about the, the matrix um, that, may, that may be easier in, in some circumstances. Uh, so instead of thinking about this uh, matrix of um, interactions and its, um, and its maximum eigenvalue, we can think of, uh, uh, think of it in terms of coupling. Um, and for the hard core distribution, what you would need to do uh, view, uh, from this point of view would be um, to take, a, um, to generate a random independent set R, a red one, that is conditioned to include the vertex V. So it's random, conditioned on V being in, and uh, you take a random blue independent set B, which is conditioned on uh, excluding V, right? And try to, so if, if they were just independent of each other, obviously they, they would disagree everywhere, pretty much. But what we want to do is to couple them onto a single probability space so that so that actually they agree or they disagree only on a, on a small set of vertices. And this, this trick can, in fact, be done in some... You can go away for 10 minutes. You can, you can figure out that if you've got such a coupling, you have spectral independence. It's not so hard. So this is, prob this is probably a... This is probably a stronger condition, but on the other hand, if you start trying to find examples which, pull, which uh, separate these two ideas, then it's quite difficult. I don't have a convincing example, in fact. Okay, so if you've got that, if you, if you were able to do this coupling trick, then uh, spectral independence would, would follow, and then you would have n log n mixing. Um, so I should um, speed up. So this is um, historic, somehow some history. Um, somehow this kind of coupling was being explored already 25 years ago by Vandenberg and Rob Vandenberg and Rahul, Rahul Brower. And uh, they used it to look at um, matchings in graphs. And then recently, uh, they didn't have, of course, this technology, so they weren't able to show n log n mixing, but they could show polynomial time. And then Chen and Gu um, used this, uh, this kind of uh, coupling trick very effectively in a certain context. Uh, but given the time, I, so this, treat that as, as, as just a, a name check. Uh, okay, given, do you, given, do you credit? Because what I want to come to is something that fascinated me. Um, we, the the, the left-hand thing I don't have to explain, right? We've already decided that this 2D lattice um, exhibits a phase transition, and when lambda goes beyond some critical value, it will go into its red phase or its blue phase. So, um, so at some lambda, sufficiently large, it will... Uh, the the, uh, the global dynamics will slow down and become exponential. So it, it will just jump from being n log n to exponential. Whereas on this second example, this so-called so Kagame lattice, there's no phase transition. You can take lambda as large as you like, and it never falls into any phase, particular phase. It remains disordered at, at arbitrarily large lambda. And in case you're thinking it's the triangles, the, the triangles uh, create what the physicists would call, um, I forgot what they call, frustra frustration, right? Then if you, if you think of the triangular lattice, it doesn't have that property because you can three color it and, and those, those colors are maximum independent sets 
And so it, it does drop into, in this case, three phases. And, and you get exponential slowdown again. So there's something very special about this particular example. Um, okay, it's, uh, so that's, uh, so bit of graph, very quick. This can be, this can be just sort of very hand wavy. Claw is just uh, K13, so it's a, the stars, four vertices, the vertex in the center has degree three and the others are, it's a tree, little tree. Um, so that's a claw. Claw-free subgraph is a uh, gr graph is one that does not contain the claw. It's an induced subgraph. So you can't find in it anywhere a claw. It turns out that, uh, so this is way back, Matthews, who's a PhD student at Edinburgh when I was there, showed um, the mixing times polynomial for claw-free graphs at any lambda. So again, that, that implies there's no phase transition from claw-free graphs. And, of course, what, what I'm going to say is that if you stare at the Kagame lattice, you discover there are no claws in there. So that is kind of what's go what seems to be going on. Um, now, with this new technology uh, and using the coupling idea, uh, Chen Gu showed the optimal mixing uh, for... Um, for Glauber dynamics on claw-free graphs uh, for when the maximum degree is bounded. Unfortunately, if you let lam lambda has to be bounded, otherwise things, uh, otherwise you get a, yeah, things break down. Okay, so can you push this a bit further? So, uh, yes, so in the graph theory literature, on, on these um, hereditary properties of graphs, uh, there's a lot of work on um, you know, on what classes of graphs can you exactly solve the independent maximum cardinality independent set problem on that class? And um, uh, an unknown question, uh, so something that's unknown is, um, is, is uh, which in graphs to exclude to get polynomial time and which exclude, uh, uh, keep you at, at MP. Hard. That hasn't been completely solved, but you can see if you read this that for bounded degrees graphs, it's basically solved. And the, and the answer is um, it remains. Uh, uh, yeah, you have a polynomial time algorithm if you exclude um, a claw or anything that you can get from a claw by subdividing edges. Okay, so you, you, you see I start with a claw there and I start subdividing the edges and I get these, these larger and larger things. And if you exclude any of those and the degrees bounded, then there's a polynomial time algorithm for the max independent set. And uh, if you exclude anything else, it goes polynomial. So that somehow that's a complete solution. Or at least if you got rid of the maximum, the maximum cardinality, if you... Uh, the if you got rid of them, the uh, bounded degree bit, that would be a complete solution. So uh, what, uh, so all, all, I've show, all I've shown is that um, the same is true. Exactly the same char thing characterizes the Glauber dynamics. Uh, so if you, uh, if you exclude a subdivided claw, that's the third bullet point, then the mixing time is optimal. If you exclude a path, which is a sort of an even simpler thing than actually, um, then actually you've only got a finite set of instances there, so that's not very interesting. Anything else, then the mixing time is, is exponential. And I, I thought, uh, uh, because it's just pictures, I know I'm overrunning a bit, but uh, there's a picture which explains how you would couple the, a red, the red one, remember, has to include that vertex, the blue excludes that vertex, that's the vertex V. So uh, let me build red and blue starting from the vertex, only revealing the bits that I need to reveal. Adjacent to L, we've got three vertices, and none of them can be red because red is an independent set, but some of them might be blue. So I, I, I reveal uh, which ones are blue, and there they are. That's the first step. Okay, and that gives me a set L1. And I reveal uh, the, the graph. I look at the graph and I see what the neighbors are that I haven't seen already. 
They can't be blue, but they can be red. So I, I reveal the red, conditioned obviously on what I've revealed so far, which is V. And it turns out that L2 is there. And then from L2, I can look at its neighbors. They can't be red, but they could be blue. So I reveal that, conditioned on the blue that we've already got. And then it's got some neighbors. And I reveal they could be red, uh, but they're not. OK. And at that point, uh, you, you probably need about five minutes to see this. But at that point, when it halts, uh, actually, the rest of the graph, you can fill it in how you like. So at that point, you might as well choose this, make the same choices for red and blue. So it's only on this section you get disagreement. The rest of it, you can have perfect correspondence between red and blue. OK, if you think, you, you need to think about it a bit, but that's, uh, that's true. Um, so we, the, the, thing, the point is that if we, um, so, so now it, it just degenerates into sort of this graph theory thing and case analysis. And you discover that for subdivided clause, the front where things are happening is bounded size. So at each iteration, actually, you might finish. There's always a positive probability bounded away from zero that you don't select anything from that layer, and then everything holds. So, so within um, expected number, of, constant number of iterations, you 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 um, you stop, and then uh, that's your area of disagreement. It's constant size, and that does the trick. So, uh, and this this you this idea you of building out uh, and constructing the coupling starting from a, uh, works in quite a lot of, so ignore that. And, uh, oh yeah, so all I have to say now is what were my, my key sources for this work? Um, so there's a nice um, survey or expository article there at the top, which is good for coming to speed with this new material. Um, there's the the Chen and Gu, which I use as uh, inspiration for this stuff on clause, and it's described in this um, last thing. <coughs> oh, yeah. Yep, sorry. Yeah, it's a bit. Uh, a bit <laughs>